Good morning and welcome, Big Data Analytics with Excel. Big data, big room. So I'll make mention that uh, usually I'll encourage questions. That may be a little challenging in a room of this size. Um, certainly challenging because I have a lot of content within 60 minutes. So unless it's an absolutely compelling question, we have two microphones here, you may come up. But I would welcome questions offline at the end of the session. I think that could be preferable given the time I have and the space that we're working within. So good morning, my name is Peter Myers. I'm a BI expert. I've come from Melbourne, Australia to share with you my experience and passion around Microsoft data analytics. And specifically in this session is to introduce big data and Excel. Perhaps an unusual combination, but I think it allows us to talk about two in combination. Please note that this is not necessarily the way that it does work, but it can work this way. I've worked with Microsoft Business Intelligence products now for 15 years, and I work as a consultant, a mentor, and trainer. If you'd like to connect with me, I include email and LinkedIn details here. In this session, there are really two objectives with an intersection at the end, and that is we make no assumption that you've ever worked with big data. We probably make the assumption you've heard about it, but we're going to begin with the introduction to what is big data, what problems has it been designed to solve, and what is Microsoft doing? And end-to-end, -end, how can we produce a solution? And then we'll bring in a self-service story with Excel and show you techniques by using Power Query, Power Pivot to build solutions on top of your big data. All right, so to set the scene. Now, in fact, before I start setting the scene, I'm going to switch to my first demonstration. And this is important that I do this now because I'm going to create a new cluster in the cloud, and I'll describe what this is when we get to that point in the theory. But because it takes about 15 minutes to spin up, now is the time to get this going. So here I am in my Azure portal. The first thing that I'm going to do is create some storage. So with Azure storage, like a file system in the cloud, I can subscribe and provision storage space with simplicity. So let me go ahead and... Don't ask again. Create some new storage. Nordic Rally. I like the green tick here. It says that nobody else has reserved this endpoint on the internet. Uh, we'll go ahead and make this locally redundant. And as quickly as that, I'm spinning up storage space. This will be required by the cluster, the big data cluster, and my big data will need to be stored in the cloud. Step two now that I have storage, is to go ahead and create the big data cluster. Nordic Rally. And nobody has this endpoint as well. I'm going to create a two-node cluster. I'll provide the administrative password and repeat it. And then use that new storage account. And this will be creating a two-node cluster basically virtual machines in the cloud, Windows Server 2012 R2. Let's leave that running. And now let me switch back to describe the introduction. So what is big data? And I often refer to this that in English, we say that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And as we have this data explosion, whether it's devices, social networking, sensor networks, pumping out an extraordinary volume of data that is now being captured and stored, uh, we have a new challenge on just how to do that. How do you capture and store this? Fortunately, in combination, we see that storage prices have been plummeting, as has processing price. So the combination of the two opens up new potential, capture, store, and therefore process, and in a business intelligence sense, enable us to explore and visualize big data. If I go to the trustworthy source of Wikipedia, they'll describe big data as a collection of data sets that are so large and complex that it becomes awkward to work with them by using traditional techniques. So classically, we would take our data, push it into a relational database system, and then to support analytics and reporting, it was just a matter of querying it. But that's no longer the case. Either it's impractical, uneconomic for the volumes, or simply impossible due to the structures of data that aren't anymore conveniently tabular. The difficulties can include capturing, storing, searching, sharing, and specific to this presentation, the challenge of how we can analyze and visualize big data. You'll typically hear about big data described in terms of Vs, and I'm going to stick with the three Vs, being volume, being variety, and being velocity. 
So it's pretty obvious when you think about the terminology big data that does imply large volumes of data. And just what is a large volume of data? Well, Facebook today, well, actually in 2012, they recorded that it had 100, 100 petabytes of data sitting in their big data storage at the accumulation of half a petabyte a day. All right, so these are one end of the spectrum, perhaps some of the biggest implementations of big data, but big data could be relative to you. What does that mean? And in comparison to the traditional approach, if I used, for example, SQL Server, big data could just mean that it's becoming impractical for SQL Server to store or inefficient for it to process without me spending a lot more money on licenses to make it improve. And that could be then the tipping point for you that big data for you just means that it's now more sensible to store it in a different way and process it in a different way. And we'll explore that here in this topic. Not all data is conveniently tabular, which is a new challenge for the database professionals. Gone are the days where we can just insert into columns of a table. So when we look at data beyond um, structured data in text files, we might have um, text data, tweets, status updates in Facebook, uh, binary data, images. There's an array of data out there that can no longer be conveniently simply stored in SQL Server. And sure, there's an XML data type, there's sparse columns, there's file streaming, uh, but this pushes a product like SQL Server beyond its limits. Velocity, I think this one's obvious that if we have big volumes of data, it does imply a high rate of insert. All right, so the other challenge might be capturing data at high velocity and then storing that appropriately. Interesting to plot then variety and velocity, that these systems, your classic line of business applications and the databases that support these, um, note that this isn't a problem that requires a fix. There is no need to think that you must re-architect and redesign these to become a new storage and processing approach. Leave them be. Moving up in size, perhaps to the terabytes, and, and SQL Server will comfortably work with this volume of data, but this might be where you assess a tipping point, that according to the way that we store and query this data, maybe, just maybe, it's more economic to do this differently rather than the traditional relational approach. Certainly when we move up to the petabyte range with Yahoo, Google, Facebook's as obvious, and note that uh, as of 2013, half of the Fortune 500 companies are using Hadoop and big data distributions. For these data sets, large data sets or clickstream, weather, text image data, this is certainly where big data as a new approach has been used to target. So where there is a need, there is a solution, and that's what we'll introduce here. Now I'm just going to check on that cluster to make sure. And we can see here that it's still processing, and that's as I'd expect. It would be disastrous to my series of demos if that wasn't going to work. What big data, the capture and processing of big data allows us to do is respond differently and to perhaps a new set of questions. When it comes to social analytics, we could now ask questions like, what's the social sentiment? What do people feel about our product? So let's imagine that Microsoft, with their release of Power BI as just one topic, might want to assess what the market feels about the product. And not just the market, we would like to define the market in terms of demographic attributes, maybe uh, geogra geographic attributes, gender, age groups. And so some analyst at Microsoft would be burdened with the task of answering this question, what do people feel? And we would like a response relatively soon. So doing a survey and a phone survey is not quite the approach that would happen here. And when you think now of the data sources available due to social analytics, for this example, we've got tweets that we could assess. We have Facebook likes and status updates. We have blogs. So there's a vast array of data out there that holds value. Should you be able to identify, capture, appropriately store, and then process? So this is, in basic and fundamental terms, how you might solve that problem. Now, it's interesting to note um, a lot of people have Facebook accounts. By show of hands in the room, who here has? Maybe easier to say who doesn't have a Facebook account. OK, so I would suggest here that that's 10 or 15% of the room doesn't. And I'm part of that group for, for a number of reasons. How much do you pay a month to benefit from using Facebook to share your images, to share your status updates with the friends and colleagues? How much do you pay? 
zero, 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 hold on, isn't Facebook a highly valued company? In which case, where is the value in this company if they don't charge for their services? Can you appreciate that you are in fact a free source of labor, whereby you're very happy to share who you are, what you do, the photographs that you've taken, and I, I guess it's a bit of a trade-off that you get a service in response, but certainly the data that you make available to Facebook is owned by Facebook. Certainly they will not disclose privacy details about who you are. But what they will do is make this data available to an organization like Microsoft that have this interesting question to understand what people feel about Power BI. Microsoft can then approach Facebook and request information about any mentions of Power BI, and what they could retrieve then is a set of data that might have status updates, and it may also, and it should also, have accompanying information about who you are. Not to the detail of name, phone number, and address, but certainly to your gender, your location, your age group. And this is incredibly useful to solve this type of problem. So imagine that there is a mass of data available, not just from Facebook, but LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on. We would then prepare this data, we would consolidate it, and then we'd have the task of somehow inferring sentiment from what you have to say. And so where there is a need, there is an invention. And data mining and machine learning techniques have, with a high degree of accuracy today, been able to translate text into a score. I really love Power BI plus 10. I really don't love Power BI. The single inclusion of that single word, or in fact two words, uh, results in a minus 10, and perhaps zero if it's a neutral assessment. So at this point, our mass of data could be analyzed. We could filter group by, filter by Denmark, group by gender, and then give me the average of sentiment score, and we've arrived at the answer to what people feel about Power BI. And essentially, that's how it works today, but the new challenge is that data is scattered in different formats and potentially large volumes, so this could well be solved through big data techniques. A live data feed. How do I optimize my services based on patterns of weather, et cetera? If you consider the extraordinary number of sensors there today, monitoring traffic, congestion, weather, and a need for us to assess what's happening with relative speed, Again, this is likely to be a big data problem solved through big data techniques. Lastly, when it comes to advanced analytics, there's been a number of sessions here at this event that have talked about how you can mine data. Interesting to discover patterns and, and uh, where you trust those patterns to be reliable and accurate, you can then perform predictions. So big data allows us to perform mining across big sets of data. it's now appropriate to introduce this cute little yellow elephant. So wherever you see this elephant, he signifies Hadoop, which is in fact an open source set of projects designed to solve big data problems. Um, the story is that Doug Cutter in 2005, a pioneering developer, solving this problem of big data, his son had a toy yellow elephant named Hadoop, and I guess the fit might be that Hadoop being a big animal was there to solve big data problems. So it is, in fact, a set of open source projects that can transform commodity, not special hardware, into a service. And it does this through distribution. The first is that you need to be able to capture and store your big data. So HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, is the ability for you to store your data across potentially hundreds of servers. So if you think of a single disk array and using RAID 5 and striping across, providing us perhaps good performance, but also redundancy, should there be some failure with a single disk. It's the same concept, but scaled across multiple servers. So as you add files to HDFS, they are striped across, typically 64 or 128 megabyte blocks across, by default, three times, which means should any server go down, automatically that data can be reconstructed. So that's key. Your data must be protected, and it's achieved with HDFS. Now, when you are ready, you can then use distributed processing, whereby the process is delivered down to the data itself. And through jobs and task scheduling, the big data is then processed in parallel. And so this is, in essence, what can be achieved with Hadoop. The key attributes is that it's open source. Yahoo, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft via Hortonworks are all contributors to the collection of projects. 
highly scalable. If you need more storage or if you need more compute power, you simply add more servers to your array. It doesn't run on any special big mainframe. It just runs on ordinary, well-equipped servers. It's redundant and reliable, so there should be no data loss. And it uses, in its first phase anyway, a batch processing approach that says that when you issue an instruction to compute, um, it's distributed through jobs and tasks as a map job. And this mapping occurs on each server. When each job is completed, basically a reduce aggregates the results, and there we have it. There's our computational result. Now, of my interest as a business intelligence practitioner is to consider how I can leverage this for analysis and visualization. And we always need to bear in mind that our business users are fairly impatient when it comes to querying systems. About five years ago, we would say that the benchmark was five, but no more than eight seconds should be the response time. But in this day of fast-moving technology and everything else, it's really three to five seconds. And I can tell you, and you will see through the demonstrations in this session, that we're not going to achieve a query result in five seconds. So we will wrap up with a discussion and considerations for how you can build business analytics to meet the demands of your business users, but by basing it on big data. It's interesting at this stage to perform a comparison between the traditional relational database systems and Hadoop. So from a data size, certainly SQL Server as an established and mature product could store reliably up to the terabytes and possibly beyond. Uh, but certainly Hadoop up to the petabytes and even up to the exabytes. The access is not interactive. It's going to be batch driven. The updates, it's pretty much right once. We'd expect that the files that you store in Hadoop are immutable. They, they don't change. My demonstration today in this session will be about web logs. Once those web logs have been created, we don't expect to retrospectively change what the web server recorded. So it's right once, read many times. The structure, unlike in the relational world where you declare upfront your tables and columns and data types, this is not the case here. It's simply a file system, and you may dynamically impose a schema for a particular type of query. This could be achieved programmatically or through abstraction. Integrity, well, there's not really true support for the ACID properties, so consistency, transactional isolation doesn't really exist to the file system, so it's low. There are no foreign keys either. What is interesting and what makes it stand apart, so certainly the volume, but when it comes to the scaling, you may well be aware as a DBA that if you want to half the query response time on a relational engine, you do not simply double the processing power. It is not linear. And bearing in mind that that's the expensive way that we upgrade or upsize a server is that if you are going to double the grunt with more processes, you are doubling the license cost as well. The way that it works with big data is it's near linear. If you would like to double or half the performance time, you will simply double the number of servers and achieve uh, near linear scaling. Lastly, from a human resources perspective, one DBA on average per 40 servers. In the big data world, one per 3,000. Now we can introduce what Microsoft are doing in this space. Now, my approach in this session is to talk about cloud-based big data. But let me just mention briefly up front that Microsoft do, with SQL Server, the APS, the Analytic Platform Service, formerly known as the Parallel Data Warehouse, PDW, is one way to achieve big data on-premises with Microsoft. It is an appliance. You're going to have to buy it all as hardware, software, and also uh, consultants to install and set this up. It is for analytic workloads, but it includes an appliance called Polybase, uniquely offering the ability via T-SQL to query relational structures at the same time as querying big data. We're not here to focus on APS in this session. Here I am working with Azure, the ability to store big data in blob storage, and when I'm ready, to fire up a cluster and process against the blob store. And that is branded Azure HD Insight, Microsoft's Hadoop-based service enabling big data solutions in the cloud. The key attributes about this service include that it is truly 100% Hadoop. It's not Microsoft's variation. So it is Hadoop, built on Hortonworks data platform. So Microsoft worked with them. If I get the question that, yes, we want big data, we don't want APS, we want it on-prem with Windows, you could achieve this, but Microsoft will not sell you that product or service. They would, however, introduce you to Hortonworks that could provide that solution for you with a distribution on Windows on-prem. 
What differentiates Microsoft's big data is that you may also develop MapReduce, which is traditionally done in Java, but also may be done with .NET languages. It can be automated with PowerShell and the command line. So my first demonstrating, demonstration creating the cluster could have been automated through PowerShell script. And lastly, and as I'll demonstrate, a unique capability is that we can, by using Excel and the Power add-ins, connect to, query, and visualize big data. So how does it work? Now, before I switch to this discussion, we're still processing. This is fine. You need to have big data. That means you need big data stored in file format of any format if you're choosing uh, in either HDFS. Now, here's the interesting twist. If you're going to use Azure HD Insight, HDFS only exists when you fire up the cluster. It's being created for me right now in the cloud. Now, the cluster that you're firing up is the expensive part in this solution. The storage is relatively cheap, pay as you go for what you use. But when you want to compute it and you're firing up potentially 256 nodes in a cluster, you're going to pay per hour for each machine. So the approach here is to minimize cost is create the cluster when you need it, destroy it when you've finished. What that means, however, is that you destroy HDFS. So the Microsoft approach is that you store your data not in HDFS but in Azure Blob Store, and the cluster, providing it's within the same data center, can go ahead and process from the Azure Blob Store. So this one's pretty straightforward. Just accumulate your files. In this scenario, I'm accumulating weblog files. Let's see how that works. So part of my first demonstration was to create the storage account. So when I switch across to Nordic Rally and to the containers, there's one container. Think of the container like a drive on a file system. There's a container created named Nordic Rally that is, in fact, created by the cluster. And it's where it's storing all of its files for its operations. What I will do is create a second container for the purpose of storing my big data. The scenario is around weblogs, structured CSV weblogs. When I create the container, I can now manage its content, although the Azure portal is the least desirable way to do this. So as part of this demonstration, I have pre-downloaded a Windows application. So on the desktop, I can simply install the Azure Storage Explorer, one of many tools that allows me to connect and authenticate to my store and explore or manage the content of the Blob Store. And here it is. Adding an account, the name is Nordic Rally. And not anybody can connect via the internet and manage our account, so we have a key which you would clearly keep private, and you would share this with those that have a need to, excuse me, dun, dun, dun. storage, Nordic Rally, manage the access keys, and the primary access key, when I copy it, can then be applied to authenticate against the store. Test the access, looking good, click Save, and now in this Explorer, I can navigate between the containers, so I'll show you here in the Nordic Rally, there's an accumulation of files that are being there uh, set up for the cluster. And the weblog container that I've just created is, of course, empty. So let me upload my big data representing weblog files. Very, very simplistic. So up front, this is not truly big data. But let me assure you, in a 60-minute session, we would never get through the processing if it truly was big data. So what I have here are four files representing the yearly accumulation of weblog data. So you'll see here that the largest file is five megabytes. No, this is truly not big data, so I ask you to use your imagination to some degree. By clicking Open, I am now uploading those files. Let's explore the content of the very first one, a double click. Let's view the content as text. And let me introduce you to what this data means. All right, so each request is being logged in terms of an IP address. We have the customer authentication available to us because there are multiple requests within the one session. We can see there's a multi-session. We have date and timestamp, and then we have the request that's coming in. Now, notably, if they're requesting the browse.aspx, we also have 
what product they requested. And then finally, we have the status and the number of bytes transferred. So the type of questions we could ask of this data would be who, when, what product had been browsed. And that's the solution that I'll finish up with in Power Pivot based on this data in the cloud. Fingers crossed when I switch across that that cluster has been created. All right, creation of cluster is, cre uh, is complete. So there's one other thing that I'd like to do to enable remote access. I'm going to run a pig command shortly. I'm going to go into the cluster configuration, and I'll enable remote access. And that will take a couple of moments, because it's going to connect to the head node of the cluster, and it's going to set up an account and enable remote desktop access. That was managing the Azure Blob Store and ensuring our web logs are there. How would this happen in the real world? Well, the perfect scenario would be that you're using Azure websites and the same data center, and those logs don't even need to leave the data center. They just spill directly into the Blob Store. If you're working on premises, then it will be your responsibility one way or another to get those up there. And there are utilities and components that could help you do this, but essentially you will be concerned with the volume and the velocity to ensure that you've got sufficient time to get the data up there. If you're going to use cloud-based big data with Azure HD Insight, you're going to need to have the data in Azure Blob Store. Next, and when you're ready. And today, there are customers that are simply warehousing their data. They recognize in the future they'll need big data processing, but for today, it's simply storing it. We take the approach now that data has value. Why delete it when it's economic to, to accumulate it? So when you're ready, step two, then, is to take the processing to the data. So what you see here written in Java are two functions, one to perform the mapping, the logic that will be performed on each node, and then ultimately the reduce logic on how to consolidate the multiple map outputs. That gets compiled, and it gets distributed down to all the nodes for processing, and then a result comes back, and you do something with it. And remember, the concern with this is that this will not be an interactive process whereby we will wait three to five seconds and we'll get the response back. At this stage, then, I'd like to introduce the entire Hadoop ecosystem. And this is probably already out of date. The technology is evolving so quickly, and with the open source contribution, um, this will likely be out of date, but it's still worthy of discussion. What I have introduced to you so far is the distributed storage with HDFS and the compute achieved with the MapReduce. These are the core Hadoop components. Now, we do not expect BI developers and DBAs to write Java logic to MapReduce to get responses from their data. So where there is a need, there is an invention. So let's introduce that these data processing modules, scripting achieved with PIG. So this is procedural language allowing you to transform data into a more desirable state. You can think of it like an ETL tool. And in fact, if you're familiar with Power Query, there are many similarities. The Power Query achieves the acquisition, filtering, and preparation of data through a series of steps that iteratively refine to your end goal. That's precisely what PIG does. There is no need to write Java. It will do it on your behalf. The next one of relevance to us today also will be Hive. So Hive enables us to use SQL-like structures in terms of tables and query expressions to then query in a very comfortable and familiar way. HCatalog there is for sparse data and, and particular processing of it. There are packages that have been contributed to support graphing with Pegasus, statistical processing with R Hadoop. Machine learning has its own modules with Mahout. Mahout, interestingly enough, is the Hindi word for elephant trainer. Next, Microsoft adds in their unique capabilities, including PowerShell to automate the entire big data deployment management. C Sharp and other .NET languages can be used to write MapReduce instead of Java. And then from a data integration scenario, and I'll demonstrate today that ODBC connectivity via a driver on the desktop, I'm going to enable a query result to be retrieved into a Power Pivot model. Scoop can be used to efficiently load or export data to from SQL Server. And so this opens up the opportunity to work with Big Data and SQL Server 
manage event-driven processing, and a particular relevance to this session would be business intelligence, with a self-service flavor today using power add-ins to query and to load big data results into data models. To complete the picture, there's Uzi for pipeline workflow, there's NoSQL database with HBase, there's also the event pipeline with Flume. So there's utilities and modules that can assist you with uh, event processing, log file management, and then you've got all of the infrastructure there for Azure and its integration with the uh, Azure portal and other services. And finally, we'll complete the diagram with uh, APS, that's Microsoft's on-prem appliance with Polybase supporting the query of both big data and analytic tables. Very, very colorful ecosystem. I'm sure it's out of date because things are just evolving so quickly. So Spark is the new interest point at the moment. And so stay tuned to see what evolution there is, that when there's a need, there will be an invention. If we need more near real-time big data, we will see things appear in this ecosystem. So I would like then to do my very first big data demonstration with what I call the hello world. In programming, the first output you do is hello world. I think in the big data world, the appropriate one would be a very simple word count. In fact, I would like to know the top 10 frequently occurring words in a single document. And let me show you what that document looks like. So here in the Azure Blob storage, in the Nordic Rally container, um, I'm going to do a filtered search on the keyword example. And as part of the cluster setup, it installs some examples like this davinci.txt. And by double clicking and viewing it as text, it's simply a document that uh, apparently is a translation of Leonardo da Vinci's notebook. Our question is to understand the 10 most frequently occurring words. And I'm going to solve this not by writing Java, but by using pig. So I have a snippet here. And let me just highlight this, that what this is going to do into variable A is load that text file. Into B, it's going to break it into words. Into C, it's going to group by each individual word and then enumerate into D each word with its count statistic. Then into E, it's going to sort in descending frequency order. And then into F, it will limit to the first 10. And then finally, the store. Now, that store is going to kick off a whole series of MapReduce logic to achieve that outcome. So I think, as you well appreciate, that's a reasonably straightforward thing to achieve for a database developer. So there's a complete library, and user-defined functions can also be developed to enable this type of data processing. Let me copy, switch back to the portal, and now I will connect using remote desktop to the head node of the cluster. It is Windows Server 2012 R2. As many nodes as you would like, I think to a maximum of 256. And so on the desktop of this machine is the shortcut to open up the Hadoop command line. And here we have it. So let me just maximize the font size. And then I'm going to navigate to the pig home folder. And in the bin is the pig utility. And when firing up pig, it gives us a grunt command line. And into grunt, I'm going to go ahead and paste the script. And now when I press Enter, that store is firing off MapReduce across the two nodes of my cluster. Jobs and tasks are firing off all over the place. In order to process our request for the top 10 frequently occurring words. Now, for a file that is about 1.33 megabytes in size, this really isn't a problem to be solved with big data. But it's going to take maybe one, maximum two minutes to process this. So I need to sort of ask you to be a little bit more creative with your mind, thinking there's really thousands of text documents of large size. That the overhead involved in spinning up the jobs and the tasks and the scheduling and the mapping and the reducing, there's a lot of overhead. 
And so clearly this is not a design approach that would be used for such a small volume of data. So while it's processing this on a virtual machine in the cloud, I'm going to switch down to Excel. And I have Power Query installed. So the output of the pig job will result in a file being stored into the Azure storage. Let's then set up connectivity to the Azure Blob Store. And that's easily achieved with Power Query by using the from Azure, from Azure Blob Store, the name of the account. OK, so for my storage account on the dashboard, you'll find that there are endpoints for the different types of stores. So for the Blob Store, I simply copy the endpoint. Of course, I'm required to authenticate, so let me switch back and look up that key. And then what Power Query can do is for an individual container, which would be my Nordic Rally container, is you can fire off a query against it. And each row that is returned here represents a single file. The columns represent attributes that describe the file. Switching back to the cluster. So here in the command window, we should see the occasional statistic pop up telling us how complete the processing is. So be aware that the latency here can be managed for PIG by having this automated. You could run via a scheduler, maybe the SQL Server agent could run a PowerShell script that creates the cluster against your Azure Blob Store and performs processing. The output would be sent to Azure Blob Store, and then it would automate the destruction of the cluster. So that when you arrive tomorrow morning, by 6 AM, this processing was complete. And then you can connect using a tool like Power Query to query the results. Eighty-seven percent complete. Are there any questions that I might be able to handle? A little challenging in a room of this size, but it is challenging to present on this because there's so much latency between the activities that I need to demo. I think we're actually pretty close. So there we go. Success. The grunt is done. The pig, in fact, it's pig Latin more efficiently, is doing its job. I'm going to close that remote desktop connection. Now back in Excel, let me apply a filter on the name. And I'm going to filter for any file that contains the words top 10. There are, in fact, three files. It is this result output file. And the binary here represents the content of the file. Because it's text and it's structured, it returns this two-column result. So I would rename the first column to be frequency, rename the second column to be word, and there is the result of what da Vinci wrote. The hello world of big data, counting words. So that davinci.txt is part of the examples that are installed with your cluster, and there are tutorials that can guide you through the basics of running a pig script. From a business intelligence perspective, delivering corporate business analytics, the mature and accepted techniques today is that we capture operational data, but we ATL and load this into a data warehouse and perform analytics on top. Of course, this does not change. But when we consider in an e-commerce scenario that there is ambient data, that there are these logs being generated, and there is value also in the logs as we've seen customer details, timestamps, products that are being browsed. So beyond the traditional data warehousing approach that shouldn't need to change, what do we do with these log files? And perhaps today you are capturing them. You might be distilling some information from them, ETLing some of that data, and then simply trashing them. And with the dramatic reduction in cost of storage, uh, what companies are now doing is simply keeping everything. They don't have such a thing as a delete policy anymore. So the new approach could be this. Obviously, continue with the ETL processing and simply store those log files indefinitely. And as and when you're ready, you could perform queries against it. And then you could answer you know, particular questions that maybe you didn't have in mind today but will be relevant in the future. You have the data. And business intelligence loves 
longevity. It loves data that allows us to look at trends across time, what happened over the past 10 years with browsing patterns. You may also use ETL processes to take from this occasionally. Now, in fact, you could perform an ETL daily from the big data. And so integration services today could achieve this. So that's where I head in the next demo. When we look at analytics with big data, of course you need your big data. To process this, you'll use Hadoop, and then we can perform analytics on top. Let me show you end-to-end -end how this could be achieved by using Hive. So Hive Recall is where we can define table-like structures and query them using SQL-like statements. So returning to the cluster, we have at the bottom the query console. And this allows me, when I authenticate, to issue Hive commands. The first command will be to create a table, which would be the web log table. So here in the Hive editor, I'll provide a name, create the web log table. And in my snippets file, I have the create external table command. Let me paste it in. Let me point out, first of all, that it will access data stored as text file location at the Nordic Rally Azure Blob Store. Let me make sure that that's spelled absolutely correctly. So this is the association between the cluster and the location of the files that it'll be processing. Here we're describing the structure of the files. So for classic CSV, this is sufficient. And then we're creating what's known as an external table. It's not a real table that's storing data. It's a description declaring an interface to the files that you have in that container. So obviously, it's important that all files in that container have the same structure. Submit. This will take about 10 seconds to declare and store metadata describing a table now known as weblog. Now, it's not ANSI compliant SQL, but Hive has borrowed perhaps more accurately extended the SQL syntax to work with big data processing. So select from where group by having is all achieved. You will not find your familiar favorites from T-SQL, but you will find Java equivalents to keep track of what it's doing. I can right click here on the link and open this query in another window, and we can see its progress waiting for job to complete. This is where you're going to need a fair degree of patience as a developer. And certainly, you're going to give consideration to how business users accessing your big data can be delivered or have delivered rapid results. Let's perform a refresh. No output for this. It's simply creating a table. And that took two seconds. Let's switch back and determine in the query console Request count. All right, so a select count star from weblog. Hive is translating this into MapReduce logic, and it's being distributed and right now processing across our big data consisting of a mere four CSV documents. This is going to take about a minute. So while it's processing, I'm going to switch to the desktop. And as an administrator, I've downloaded the Hive ODBC driver. So on the desktop of a self-service analyst, it's a simple matter then of installing and agreeing to a term. And that provides the Hive driver. The next thing the administrator would do is define an ODBC connectivity with a data source name. Adding in using the Hive ODBC driver, the description would be the Nordic Rally cluster. The host for this can be achieved by simply copying the endpoint to the service in Azure. The defaults are all good. Note that it's using secure communication. And then I put in the credentials, in this case of the administrator, and we go ahead and test. So appreciate that from the desktop, there's communication taking place up to the head node of the cluster to confirm that it can connect and authenticate. In the meantime, we'll switch across to the Hive editor, and we'll take a look at the progress of this query. Any 
questions. <laughs> this could be another 15 or 30 seconds, and my tap dancing isn't terribly good, so I'm not going to start with a dance routine. There are no questions. I'm still patiently waiting, and here we see the response. Scalar value in return, 100,000 rows were contained in those four files, and it took just over a minute to achieve that result, 63 seconds. All right, so again, are your users patient enough to wait that long? And if they are, um, that's interesting, all right? So what usually happens if you make them wait too long? They forget, they lose confidence, or they simply don't um, remember the question they ask, and they have the very real danger of misinterpreting the result that comes back. All right, let's take a look at how the connectivity worked out. I like this. When you see tests completed with a success, we are good to go. So we have connectivity to our cluster established. And so the next thing that I'm going to do is open up an existing workbook. So first of all, let me take the pig results and just load that into Excel. And then I'm going to open up an existing workbook representing the partial development of a power pivot data model. Let me describe. There are actually two data connections that have been used to retrieve data to produce four tables. The first is a data service to retrieve data defining date and time information. And then from the data warehouse, we're being able to retrieve product information and customer information. So to complete this model, I need to retrieve by using the OLADB ODBC uh, connection. I need to retrieve the web log data. So I can build up a connection by using the OLEDB for ODBC drivers. Next, just simply select my Nordic Rally connection, provide the credentials, and we're good to go. Now, the table import wizard has no concept that it's connecting to a big data cluster. And yet, when we click Next, the common interface that we get for relational databases gives us the choice to either retrieve from tables and views in the database or to write our own query. And in fact, when I use the default, it queries the table structure. And it comes back and says, well, there are actually three. The first and the third are, in fact, system, and our web log table could be retrieved here. I'm not going to source it direct. I will, in fact, produce my web log table based on a Hive QL query from here. So let me describe that what it's going to do from our web log table and using a where clause that's only interested in records that have browsed to the browse.aspx page and that were successful with a result of 200, brings in three columns and uses the substring to extract the product ID. Finish. Now, it's remarkable to consider what's taking place now. From the desktop, Power Pivot with its table import wizard is using the configuration of a data source name to connect to a cloud service to send the Hive QL up, and then the map reduce under the covers is distributing logic in Java across potentially 256 nodes of a cluster. And then very patiently, we're sitting here, maybe going and grabbing a cup of coffee, two or three cups of coffee, and then eventually the result's going to flow back down. And when cached in memory, we've overcome the latency issue. And that's the key to building visualizations and analytics on top of big data, is that traditional BI applies. We would suggest to you that big data is just another data source, but needs to be treated a little bit differently because of the latencies that are concerned. That would mean pre-processing in advance of user queries. That could mean integration services could ETL from this very patiently in the middle of the night, and the fact tables would be loaded by the morning. It could mean that we pre-cache into cubes or into tabular models. This is a self-service demonstration because it's easy, but I would typically see this as a corporate solution, analysis services, tabular project, multi-dimensional project sort of, by the way. Multi-dimensional only works with OLEDB sources, so the Hive ODBC is not supported. But if you don't have a lot of volumes of data, you could create a linked table in SQL Server that does the connectivity, and then you could process cubes from the linked server. Reporting services could also achieve this too. Directly using the ODBC driver, you could use caching or rather snapshotting in reporting services to pre-process and capture the data and provide high-performance reporting results from, in this case, a Hive query. 
What we tend to talk about then is if you have big data, and especially if we represent millions or perhaps billions of requests that have been logged, we want to make that big data smaller data that is suitable for the human to analyze. So don't overlook the potential with HiveQL to do group by and having. I'm not interested in every individual request, but summarize at a time granularity what has happened with the request, and then load that in for analysis. So I see the results are flowing down now. The compute has completed, result flowing from cloud down to my desktop, now being cached in memory. The rest of the activity then is just classic power pivot. So in fact, I would like to switch before I complete this to an important task that I ask you not to forget, and that is that when you're finished with the compute power, you should destroy the cluster. I learned this the hard way. The hard way was I got a credit card bill the next month for a large amount of money. And fortunately, Microsoft were lenient given that I was presenting at one of their conferences, and so I did not have to pay. But it reinforces the point that storage is relatively cheap, but the compute power, again, depending on the number of nodes you fire up, and of course, time could be expensive, but certainly cheaper than what you've probably achieved by hosting your own data center on premises. Now, in fact, I won't delete it just yet. I've got a new part of the demo that I've just remembered. So to complete this, it's simply drag and drop. Account relates to customer. Product relates to product. The date and time key um, needs to be transformed, because I need a date key and a time key. So that's a simple calculated column, or in fact, two. So a calculated column here to translate that date and time into an integer value, year multiplied by 10,000, add the month multiplied by 100, and add the day number. And that should be date key. And for the time key, it's the hour multiplied by 100 plus the minute. And now with those keys, I can form a relationship to the other two tables to perform date and time filtering and grouping. Date key to date key. And now we see big data integration within a Power Pivot model. The last thing to do will be to surface aggregation logic. So quite simply, I'm going to create three calculated fields to perform distinct counts. The first one will become simply the customers. The second one will be the number of sessions that have taken place. And lastly, the number of products that were browsed. And in classic design style, we then hide the columns of this fact table. And what that exposes to an analyst will be a visible model that looks like this, filtered by product, customer, date and time periods. And so let me demonstrate how I can then model and visualize the web activity through the workbook. Insert Power View. This becomes my web log analysis. We would like to filter by time periods. So let's start with date. Let's start with then the year level. When you have a single column table, we can then convert this into a slicer to support filtering. So we're going to filter by calendar year 2012. Beneath it, let's bring in the month. And so because of the filter context applied, we see the 12 months of the selected year. And let's make this also into a slicer. And then we could also introduce right down to day level. So there are the days of January 2012, and now we have a slicer to support that. To analyze then, let's introduce a new table, and I'll bring in the number of, let's go for products. And because we have geographic data, I'm going to use mapping to show where people were browsing for what type of product. So let's bring in then that we have uh, the number of products. And from product, I can describe by category or maybe model. So we'll use color to display model. Why don't I see any data? Hmm. I'm expecting maybe February. Hmm. Maybe a different year. 2011, 2012. Am I doing something obviously wrong? What's missing? 
Look, thank you, obviously. Right, location. So in my customer dimension or table, I have a hierarchy here, which is the customers, which drills from. Thank you. Note this, we need to communicate with the service and send up detail for geocoding. Let's let that happen. And now the ability to drill in by double-clicking Australia, there we see state-level browsing down to my home state of Victoria. I can see what's going on right down to the city level. Man, that's achieved because my customer dimension has geographic details. There's a bit of a sneaky thing going on here. Um, you could, however, from web logs, also derive through IP address where that was coming from. So it's not actually where they browse from, but it's according to our definition of the customer. But it gives you an idea of what could be achieved to understand who is browsing what, when, and where. Um, I want to complete one other demo that I just picked up the other day with the introduction in Power Query to allow ODBC connectivity, we can now create a connection where, that's strange, ODBC, that's better, DSN equals Nordic Rally. And then I could paste in that same query, and you could fire off the Hive query now by using ODBC with Power Query. Now, it will want to know credentials, And Power Query can now achieve Hive querying through the same data source name. That's going to take about 60 seconds to run. I'd just like to wrap up with some points about BI on top of big data. So the benefits of using Power Pivot for self-service BI and, of course, data modeling for corporate BI with analysis services is that your data models can surface big data in intuitive ways to promote rapid exploration and analysis and reporting. You can easily integrate with other data sources, and I've achieved that with Power Pivot today. There are three data sources combined to produce that model. The potential is that you can load in with ODBC or via OLEDB if you have a linked server to achieve this. Power Pivot workbooks then can become the source of other reports. If you publish this on premises to SharePoint with a Power Pivot add in, people could connect to this. This is not the common scenario. Let's imagine this is a corporate solution, so it's a tabular model accessible by a wide audience of business analysts within the business. Do consider, when producing modeling on top of big data, that you may not have the volume of memory for a tabular project to store the big data. That's where we make big data small data. The workarounds could be to minimize the data by retrieving a smaller time period, or decreasing the dimensionality, or increasing the granularity with a group by and statistical aggregation. Or do a sample. Give me 10% of the big data, and we will multiply the results by 10 to give an approximate of what it could be. But as demonstrated, once that big data result is loaded and cached in memory, as is the case for Power Pivot, you can deliver high-speed results that satisfy your users within three to five seconds. So in summary for this session, I hope that I've introduced the fundamentals and the rationale behind big data, that it refers to a new scenario that you have volume, variety, velocity, and traditional techniques aren't going to help you. If they can help you, they may be impractical or uneconomic. We've covered that Hadoop has core components for distributed storage and distributed processing. In Microsoft's implementation with cloud-based big data, that's a little different. It means that your data really needs for persistency to be stored in Azure Blob Store. Fire up the cluster, pay for it when you need it, destroy the cluster when you don't. You've observed firsthand that big data queries often involve latency and significant latency. So you need to manage this appropriately. And we'd like you to think of big data as just another source of data. And you would handle it appropriately by using caching techniques within your BI layer. Let me wrap up with the last demonstration, which is to destroy that cluster. So here for Hadoop, I simply come in and delete and confirm. And the virtual machines, as I speak, are being destroyed. And the charge has stopped. From a resources perspective, there are a couple of sites here of interest to start your exploration of what Microsoft Big Data can do for you. I often get the question about, how can I learn about this? Now, in recognition, I said that there are half of Fortune 500 companies working with Hadoop today. There is a growing demand for skill set. So if you're looking for a new challenge to work with data, then Big Data is perhaps the new frontier for you. Um, there are an increasing number of publications now available. Two years ago, there was practically nothing because no one was prepared to write a book knowing that in six months it's, it's out of date. 
Uh, Hortonworks, who Microsoft work with for the distribution of Azure HD Insight and APS, do provide some free, very basic tutorials. They also allow you to download their sandbox as a Linux machine. You can download this, work with this on a Windows desktop, and there are some basic activities in Pig and Hive and other topics you might like to explore. All right, so I would like to thank you for your time and attendance and hope that we've met the objective of describing big data and one scenario of self-service analytics on top of big data. Thank you for your time and attendance.